for academic libraries at least, and the direction I like for Fogler is to continue that movement towards being more open with the community. I'm all about like holistic creation of things. So moving from a library that's just like a purveyor of information to like knowledge creation is something that excites me. That's Daisy Singh, who's come on board as the Dean of Libraries at UMaine. As the person in charge at Fogler Library, she oversees a resource that is physically and intellectually at the center of much that happens at UMaine. I'm Ron Lisnett, and this is the Main Question Podcast. It's an imposing physical presence in the very middle of the UMaine campus. Fogler Library is the state's largest research library, serving hundreds of people every day, students, faculty, even the general public. With more than three million print and digital volumes and hundreds of thousands of digital subscriptions and databases, it's also the designated state research library for business, science, and technology, and is the only patent and trademark resource center in Maine. Beyond those physical holdings, the staff at Fogler is there to help patrons drill down and wade through that sea of information to find what they need. Whether they want to research a certain topic, start a business, find a good book to read, or just see their yearbook picture. For Daisy Singh, the image of the library is a place with stacks of books and people reading away on their own, and librarians shushing people to be quiet is a bit out of date. She sees libraries as places where groups can work in teams, take a class, watch a film series, and do many things beyond being a caretaker of printed and digital words. We recently sat down with Singh to talk about libraries, where they've been and where they might be headed, and among other topics, ask the question, what role do libraries play in today's digital connected world? Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We appreciate it. Talk to me about how you got into this line of work. I imagine as a kid, books were a big deal for you, right? No, actually, it's funny. Um, not that I didn't read, but I'm not one of those bookworms, actually. Um, I think the, I always felt comfortable in libraries, so I did read, um, but it wasn't until I went to NYU as an undergrad and I became the assistant for the Latin Americanist. She was the bibliographer, and I started helping her with a, a checking out books that were on an approval plan and other, um, doing the website, it was like the mid 90s, so I was working on her website with her. Uh, and I noticed that she happened to work with Latin American collections and I was doing my uh, undergrad in Latin American studies. So she got to travel through her book collection efforts, etc. And I thought that was really cool to be able to travel as well. And so I got into the profession that way. I had worked in different libraries up to then. I just felt really comfortable and I figured, well, why not just uh, get the degree to, to, able, to be able to support this work as a professional. What do you like about libraries? Partly it's like a public space where everyone can come. There's no, as a somewhat of an introvert, there's no need to necessarily in, interact, but it, like a whole new world is open to you. Uh, and the, the materials that I tended to uh, do research on was more like audiovisual materials. So it's funny because whenever you think of libraries, people automatically think of books. But in my case, it's a little bit different. Uh, but I think it's just like a comfort level, like a quiet space sometimes. Sometimes you have spaces where you can be a little more, um, well, not quiet. Uh, but I think that's the main thing, and I just like maybe the equality of it. Everybody can come in, and it's open to all. So many of us grew up with libraries, and, and we think of them as, as sort of as you what you alluded to, which is stacks of books, tables with people sitting, reading quietly. Um, you can't make too much noise. But uh, perception versus reality, what, what, uh, what is kept from that you know, uh, history that we think about, and how are libraries basically different now in the 21st century? I mean, there's still that element where people want to be in a quiet space a lot of times to study. Um, but I think, and so it's a space for people to congregate, to study or to relax, to be with friends, etc. Um, and there's different environments now within the library maybe that accommodate different type of uh, collaboration. So, you know, the, the stereotype of the shushing librarian where everything has to be quiet and you, you can't hear a, a pin drop. Uh, is different so now there's like study rooms when people want to collaborate and there's a lot more of that and i think there's a more sensitivity to the fact that different types of learners might need different type of spaces with some level of noise or some level of um 
at least a, a feeling that people are near, even if they're not interacting with them. So that's, I think, one one staple that has modified some. And I would say that uh, libraries in general are, I think, being more open. Academic libraries, which, which is where my experience lies, so some um, listeners may be more um, accustomed to, to dealing in the public library sphere, but with academic libraries, traditionally it's been really like a closed environment for academics only, and in the last uh, few decades I think it's been uh, opened up so that the academic research could be made available more readily to the public or there's more collaborations between a library and different disciplines so that they're putting out information. So it's not just an information like repository, although it is that, but it's also uh, like a knowledge creator or like a collaborator. So I'd say that's another difference. And also, of course, uh, it's a place where we hold materials that are physical, but there's, you know, physical as in books or microform. Um, but there's also a lot of digitization efforts, both within the library and in terms of our subscription to journals and and even ebooks that, you know, not everyone, so, some people feel more comfortable with the print, but there's a lot out there that isn't print also. So there's that, that that's another difference. So we're well into the digital age where basically any text, any word that's ever written, you can pull up on your phone, right? So, uh, but, um, you know, too much information that isn't focused isn't useful, right? So do libraries sort of serve the purpose of collecting, collating, focusing information to help people, you know, learn what they need to learn? Yeah, well, to step back a little about what you said in the beginning about everything being available, I, I'm not sure that's, it, it's the impression, and of course the the world has been open to us through digital collections, but I would say that there's a lot of things that still aren't available digitally, like there might be uh, different presses in um, u- unique presses or in other countries where, especially as a Latin Americanist, um, you know, you, you can't necessarily get a book approval plan for some of these things. And in, in my background, uh, libraries tend to work with book dealers in Latin America, for example, who are more of the experts in going into the communities and, and different, um, whether it's like maybe native communities or, or other types of communities where these like unique resources are available that aren't in print. So I guess I just wanted to make sure that people don't get the impression that everything is online. But you're right, in terms of um, there's been a switch in the last few decades into librarians helping people to find information, or even the catalogers who are including the metadata to make things more um, accessible or discoverable. So there's that element that I think it was always important, but it's different now that there's digital materials and there's such a proliferation. And we have the reference librarians doing information literacy workshops to help people uh, not feel so overwhelmed by all the information and trying to use their you know critical thinking skills in order to find that information. So yeah, there's a lot of um, nuances to, to how we do library work now. It's tough to drink from a fire hose, right? I mean, you want to you just turn that down just a little bit, right? So the University of Maine recently achieved the status of being an R1 research university, which means they're in the top 146 research institutions in the country. Uh, How does Fogler help support that and and promote that? I would say first the traditional way through uh, the publications that we provide, whether monographs or the journal packages, uh, which of course is difficult because of... of, um, you know, you, we can't have it all, and so sometimes to supplement what we don't own or subscribe to, we have services like Interlibrary Loan, which allows people to request uh, physical items uh, from throughout the state and throughout the country, and even in some cases maybe internationally. Uh, and also there's digital objects that you can, or articles most for the most part, where people can request them and get them with a turnaround of less than a day typically. So that's one way. Um, I would say the other is through some of the work workshops that we've been providing related to like the Pivot database, which is a database that allows researchers to find funding opportunities and also in some cases create uh, profiles for themselves so they can learn the network out there to collaborate with. And so we have um, mostly one librarian focusing on efforts of that nature. Uh, She's running, let me remember the name, uh, 
I wrote this down because I knew it might come up and I and I so a publish and thrive challenge which is coming up in March uh, of this year it's an asynchronous program open to all particularly for early scholars um, there's a research impact challenge coming up in April uh, helping all types of researchers uh, create scholarly profiles, measure the impact of their research, and promote their work to new audiences. You know, there's a lot of mm, publications that are becoming available open access, and so just helping lead people to that work, that's another way. And with the the Pivot database, there's an online grant writing workshop on uh, March 14th as well. So you can find all those uh, events coming up on the uh, Fogler Library website. So if you walk through the stacks or the different floors in Fogler Library, you'll see a lot of students in their cubicle or at a table sort of studying on their own. But like you alluded to, people are using libraries in a lot of different ways. You also see teams of students working together or, uh, you know, groups sort of interacting with each other. Can you talk about a little bit more about the different ways people are using libraries? Uh, Just there's a lot more ways to get your work done there, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's different levels in in Fogler, of course, and some are more for quiet study. There's like different, I, I call them like the bunk beds, but they're bunk cubicles, I guess. I, I know if, if I was a student here, that's where I would go because I'd feel a little comforted by the height to the ceiling and a little protected. Um, but there's study rooms that the students can reserve. Uh, and aside from just the collaboration or independent study, I would say it's also a place to refresh. So. I'd like for Fogler to be like an anchor site where people don't necessarily have to leave. So we allow food in some areas so if they don't necessarily have to go somewhere to like have a coffee, um, although we're working on p- providing some level of coffee service in the Oaks Room. Um, but students, I mean, there's all types of ways they can be using the library through interlibrary loan services, as I mentioned, which um, that's one way. Uh, we have a federal uh, government depository library. We're, we're a regional library for Maine, New Hampshire, uh, and Vermont uh, since 1907, and potentially they can be using government documents if they're doing research on that. Uh, there's microform collections, and there's, a, there's an area in the library for that. Um, I'm trying to think. Special collections is another thing, especially if their classes are, are making use of primary resources, and they can be use, make a use of that. I mean, we have the digital commons that store some of that material also, or archives some of that material, but um, they can also visit the, the special collection staff. Because one thing I want to know, as I said earlier, that not everything is online. So if you find the list of materials through digital commons that you're interested in, uh, there might be more that hasn't been digitized yet. So it's always good to check with either a reference librarian or a special collections, an archivist or librarian, depending on what your need is. Yeah, I want to ask you about special collections in a minute because I know there's some pretty pretty cool stuff in there. But, but back to what you just said, reference librarians, what do they do? How can people uh, best leverage their expertise? Yes, yeah, so the reference librarians have uh, shifts at the reference desk. So uh, patrons, whether it's students at UMaine or the UMaine community, as well as the public can come in and ask questions. So that's one way of uh, like ad hoc, just spontaneous uh, service. Uh, but uh, librarians teach uh, standalone information literacy classes for different courses. And they we also teach, the librarians teach uh, four credit courses. Uh, with the LBR, I think is the coding. So they're teaching information literacy skills that way. And they also have a really um, nice program for information literacy workshops. So I think it was uh, last month they had a Dungeons and Dragons style information literacy workshop. So I think those things are really cool to connect with the communities already within uh, UMaine who are into something like D&D. Um, we have, I think, a conversation coming up, a discussion on banned books, um, and I'm forgetting the last one. But they have innovative program that seeks to connect, especially with the undergraduate population, um, because we try to reach all the undergraduates, but because of the setup, it's it's um, it hasn't thus far been possible to reach every single student. So if you were to poll the community, I'm not sure if everyone's has had a library class because it's not an easy thing to to catch everyone. Um, But there's many different ways. And we have, I I didn't mention, uh, but we have 
services within the library, like the main legislature has designated us as the main business science and technology library. So for example, the our business librarian runs that with a team of librarians in the sciences for the most part. So the the whole state of Maine, anyone who resides in Maine can make use of that. And there's free digital resources accessible, um, apart from the resources that you Maine, um, the Maine community has access to. So they, as reference librarians, are providing um, reference help in, in all types of business-related uh, questions about, uh, I don't know, commercial fishing or PFAs or things like that. Um, I'm starting to get into uh, the, the bigger question of what else do we do, so maybe I should <laughs> leave no, it that, there. That, that's that's, that's uh, yeah. a lot right there. Yeah. Some folks may not know that Fogler Library is open to the general public. It's not just UMaine students and faculty and staff. I mean, anybody can go get, go into the library and, and, and you know look, get what they're looking for. Yeah, and my understanding, I come from the other day because I almost couldn't believe it. My husband has a Bangor Public Library card, and I said, I think you can come to our reference desk and or the circulation desk and check something out with that. Um, and we also have, for example, the Patents and Trademark Resource Center, also run by the business librarian. Um, and that's he's trained by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, is it, those, those things are administered there. So anyone with questions regarding that can also come to him with, with those questions. And he does training with, in collaboration with the Bangor Public Library and other associations. The other thing that may not be so apparent to library patrons are the workings behind the scenes. So for example, we have the main shared Collections Cooperative, if I got the, <laughs> the MSCC, I think it is. And um, so that's li librarians uh, throughout the state working behind the scenes to ensure that our collection efforts are collaborative so that if some libraries decide to weed items for their collection, there's still other items and other collections that hold them in within a certain time frame, and then they revisit the, the collections afterwards. So things like that that the average person not, might not be thinking of, but we work a lot in consortium, especially in this state. I think it's a leader in that regard. One of my direct reports is the executive director of Maine InfoNet, with, which is like a, a resource um, consortium. So it's like a very big culture of, of sharing resources and um, talking about collections and how best to meet the needs of various, um, you know, the residents of Maine as well as the humane community. So let's talk a, a couple statistics. Uh, uh, Fogler's often described as the largest library in the state. Do you have any idea how many people you serve on an annual basis? How many holdings are there, both digitally and, and physical? And any any uh, any numbers you could uh, you could throw at us? Yeah. Well, you know, I I I didn't I don't remember the the annual, but I know that on a daily the daily counts because the circulation staff does daily counts. There's probably an average of about 200 people at the height of the day within the library, uh, and it fluctuates between the early morning and the late evening. Um, in terms of the collection counts, there's uh, we have 1.5 uh, million titles within the collection, uh, like physical titles, but that includes also federal depository items, not just like regular books. And we also have uh, 1.5 million ebooks. We also have over 160,000 um, uh, e-journals, so electronic journals, and uh, over 300 uh, databases. Wow. Now, you talked about the Business Science and Tech Services and the, and the Patent and Trademark Resource Center. Those can be used by people that are trying to start businesses, grow businesses. I mean, that, just talk about how people can access that expertise and, and those resources to, uh, to help promote Maine's economy. Yeah, I think that for the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, the business librarian fields questions from all types of people interested in those. And there's certain information that he can provide. He's not a lawyer, for example, right? But there's some guidance that he can provide and he's trained for it. And I would say with the main business, and, and also I should say that he he does presentations. So if you are, I think one of them is called SCORE, and I'm going to forget the, the, there's a lot of acronyms in this yes, place. Yes, there is. Every t ever since I came to Maine, there's, uh, we're acronym happy, but um, so SCORE is one um, 
organization that he collaborates with. But if anyone listening is part of another association, they might get in t- touch with him, John Hutchinson, in order to potentially provide a presentation and that way reach like a lot of people at once. But they can also uh, get in touch with him personally. And with the main business science and technology library, he leads it, but there's a team of, of librarians, mostly in the sciences, so they collaborate. There's questions that he can answer on the business end, and if he gets a little more detail into research, he hands it over to them. So it's a nice team. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned a couple times digital commons. Uh, let's make sure people know what what is that and how can people use it? So Digital Commons is our institutional repository. I would say most academic institutions have one now. So the material uh, that we have in special collections for the most part uh, is digitized and and is uh, archived there. So we have, uh, for example, the theses and dissertations that come out of UMaine will be there. Um, but we have special items like there's a main music box let me remember what the <laughs> yeah. I keep the all, all, main music box collection so there's mostly scores but there's other material in there including like a small number of mp3 like files uh, related to those collections um, there's a main uh, postcard collection from the early 20th century for example um, when I visited uh, the special collections the the archivist uh, I they they pointed out to me that during the Vietnam War there was a blood drive and that there was a maybe like a 15 minute clip of of people being interviewed with respect to that so something like that is there and it's pretty cool to listen to um and yeah things tend to get in some cases uh digitized by request but there's other efforts with different um staffers at the library that are putting whole collections on there as well so there's, uh, for people that are alumni of the University of Maine, that's the other thing is all the yearbooks are there. So you can you can look up your, your picture from when you were in school or your parents, your grandparents, whatever you'd like, right? Yeah, and you know, um, I recently visited the annex because we have an annex site on the, on, for Fogler on the campus. And I was really impressed because they showed me a physical copy of PRISM from, I think it was 1963. And when they showed the pictures, there was some kind of ball and Duke Ellington was there. And I heard that Bob Dylan was also here so it's one of those things that I didn't expect Um, so whether you find it digitally or with the physical item it's pretty cool special collections you've referenced that a couple of times what what are the most interesting and popular items that are held there what there's some unique things there so so I'm trying to think um, I know that there's like two two thousand collections and they range from like one sheet of paper to like uh, um, like dozens of boxes. Um, one of the unique ones is uh, William S. Cohen, the William S. Cohen paper. So he was a, a U.S. Uh, House of a Representative, a U.S. Uh, Senator, and then went on to be uh, Defense Secretary. You probably know this because you're a Mainer, right? Um, so that's one huge collection. That's the biggest one. Um, the one that I was interested in, which we recently focused, um, featured on social media, was a letter from Booker T. Washington to the then president of UMaine asking if there were any uh, African-American, although although he uses a, uh, the term colored in the letter, um, graduates who might be uh, willing to teach at the T- Tuskegee Institute. And he got a response, so it's like a two-page item that I was shown. Um, other interesting things are there. there's, a, I believe, a Hispanic society Sigma Delta Pi. Don't don't call me on the on the name. But apparently, there's an institution in South Carolina, I believe, that needed uh, a few copies, and we had them, and we were able to ship them um, for their use. So things like that that um, that have interested me. And, I, and with, there's actually a, a staff pick section on Fogler, so you'll see some of the archivists and other uh, special collection staff have picked out items as well. Wow, that's great. So how, how do you see libraries evolving and changing in the coming decade? What other new areas, services might be uh, offered that are particularly exciting to you? Where, where, where's all this going? Yeah. So for academic libraries, at least, and the direction I like for Fogler is to be to continue that movement towards being more open with the community, invite, since we are open to, to everyone, uh, so that people don't have the feeling that we're just academic and we're not here for them. So... Ideally, I'd like to create a, a 
an open scholarship and digital scholarship section or unit in the library uh, in order to promote the open access publishing efforts within UMaine and also to promote more collaborative efforts with different faculty doing digital projects on different platforms like to showcase uh, primary resource materials that we have in the library that they're using for classes or any like text mining projects, things that, that I don't have an expertise on, but I like the idea of a holistic library where there's a collaboration between the faculty, uh, the librarians, the archivists, the, the other staff, because there's a lot of staff in the library who really do great work. Um, and so I, I, I'm all about like holistic creation of things. So moving from a library that's just like a purveyor of information to like knowledge creation is something that excites me. Uh, and just generally speaking, being open to different types of users, like it's cool. I have some um, background with uh, indigenous film. That's the research I used to do. So it's cool that there's this connection with the Penobscot and the Wabanaki community here. And it'd be nice to have like more events. Like we're, we, I'd like to, we, we recently rechristened, I guess, the uh, the former university club as the Salon. It's still in the Lynch Room. And so it's a place that I'm hoping people will retire to after a formal function to have a coffee there or something. But we'd also like to inaugurate a salon series to have different um, maybe luminaries or so whoever we can get. We know there's a, there's a limited budget also, but someone we can get that has uh, interesting conversations. So just to bring the community in more, involve them, um, and will always be an academic library, but there's a way to be an academic that's still open to others. So, right. yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing, sharing your thoughts with yeah. us. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Ron. Thanks, as always, for checking us out. You can find all our episodes on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, UMaine's YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook pages, as well as Amazon and Audible. Send us a note with a question or comment if you have any. Main question at main.edu. This is Ron Lisnett. We'll catch you next time on the main question.